Greetings, Mickey 102. I'm going to talk to you today about creating schematics. And um, first, I'll start off with some examples. I want to impress upon you that they're not the same thing as engineering drawings. They're not meant to be photorealistic per se. They're just about capturing the sort of overall structure or intent of a, of a model, let's say, or, or um, a, well, a representation of something that may be physical, may be made up. In this case here, I'm showing you a picture or a schematic that was made actually for a past Mechie 102 exam problem. So it was completely made up here, but it, well, it could represent something physical in the sense that you've got some spring that launches a box, goes up this hill and has a, this, this uh, strange shape to the path. Uh, but the key things are on here, some labels to indicate what different things are, um, symbols defining quantities such as the, the uh, distance the spring was compressed, delta, spring constant K, <clears throat> labeling some masses on here. Uh, I've used the idea of a dashed line and a little bit of a lighter gray to indicate some later position. Also dimensions that are shown on here and a coordinate system. So a pretty common thing here. This would all set the stage for some sort of an analysis. Um, another example. <clears throat> this was from actually from a numerical methods class that I taught in the past. Although it's a dynamics problem, it eventually uh, results in a a pretty complex differential equation which governs the motion. In fact, this was an equation that was written for the, the uh, angle theta as a function of time as this thing was set into motion. But it shows a number of elements on here. This rigid arm on a pivot, a couple of springs. There's this quadratic sliding friction, which is a little bit more advanced than what we talk about in Mechie 102. But again, you can see that it shows uh, lots of definitions of different elements that are on here for the analysis. This is from a presentation I had done many years ago for a wind turbine class that I taught that uh, dealt with the airfoil design on the turbine blades. And uh, another version of that, which is identifying lift and drag forces and other geometric parameters, a bunch of formulas. So this is a busy, this is actually a slide in a presentation. But it shows the idea of the identifying the cross section of the wing and all these other terms that are on there. So that's a good example of a schematic again. <clears throat> Here's one that I did not draw but I also used it in the wind turbine class. A little bit of a bridge between a more realistic sort of a, a drawing. So it shows the tower and the, the, the nacelle of the wind turbine, but it was showing on there a depiction of the um, force distributions on the blades. So I would still consider this a schematic in that sense, a rather good one, it's out of a textbook. Here's one that I had drawn um, just to represent the definition of a differential surface area element on a sphere. I think that might be the end. Nope, one more here. This one I did not draw. This is of a combined cycle uh, power generation plant between a gas turbine and a couple gas turbines, a steam turbine. I like this one because in particular, <clears throat> it shows the concept of what we mean by a schematic. These, uh, like these trapezoidal shapes, that really is what the, the rotors on these turbines sort of look like overall. I mean, there's all kinds of blades and stuff that are not captured, but it's just showing you the main idea of that with some kind of a shaft in between them connect to some kind of generator. The point is these blocks just capture the sort of the intent, I guess a little bit of the functionality maybe. Um, it's more about how these things are connected together. This is more of a flow diagram of the different, uh, um, in this case, steam and water and so forth that moves through these uh, drums and these uh, superheater and evaporator coils, things like that. Um, so it, it's not meant to be anywhere near photorealistic. It captures, and there's probably, in, if you went out to the site where this thing might exist, there'd be far more details of stuff in there with actual piping connections and so forth. It doesn't capture any of that. It captures the overall scope of what's in here. So this one, I like that from that perspective. So I didn't draw that one. I did draw this one. This one I used with a program called Inkscape. It's an open source uh, graphics, it's like a drawing program. It's an open source version of Adobe Illustrator. Both of those are very good programs. They've got pretty steep learning curves, however, but they're extremely capable. <clears throat> I didn't draw that one. Did this, uh, well, this was in PowerPoint. Also PowerPoint. Also in PowerPoint, believe it or not, is this particular slide. And this one was also in PowerPoint. So what I'm gonna show you today is how to draw these types of schematics that I'm showing you, for instance, one right here in PowerPoint. So. That may seem a weird place to be drawing things. Um, there are plenty of other programs. Again, I don't even know how many. Uh, the ones I mentioned, Adobe Illustrator and Inkscape are pretty popular ones. But like I said, they have some fairly steep learning curves. They're extremely powerful. Um, but to do what you see on the screen right here now, 
doesn't really need anything quite that advanced. Um, and my thought of this too is that PowerPoint is pretty widely available. Uh, it is in line with what we're talking about in Mechie 1 or 2 using Excel and Word and so forth. So it just, it makes sense to do that. Should point out too that what I'll show you, the toolbars are available in Word and in Excel as well as they are in PowerPoint. But the way they're used in Word and Excel is a little different, a little bit cumbersome. I think PowerPoint is really probably the best. So let me show you, <clears throat> I have an example here of how these things might be used. This is a PDF actually, but start as a Word document. Um, this is a past problem as well, an exam problem from Mechie 102. Um, so you can see some of the written description there, but I want to point out that there's a, a schematic on the right, which shows this system in multiple states actually. So it's trying to show something about a starting state, how these things are arranged, these, these masses that can slide up and down on a rod, a frictionless rod. Um, dimensions of some things, there's a spring, there's a coordinate system. So that's kind of a picture of the overall system. If I scroll down here, then what I had done is showed individual pictures of different states. So when we talk about uh, work energy theorem and so on, these are the kind of things you'll talk about, identifying different states of the system and energies that would be present there. So there's a starting state one, and then the state two as the mass has moved up, spring is no longer compressed. Just before it hits the upper mass, after just after it's hit and after it goes up and stops slides up the distance basically you're firing this lower mass up it's hitting the upper mass and pushing it up a certain distance so anyway the, the more important part about this is i've got a, a schematic here that's been actually kind of repurposed multiple times here each one of these is just a picture if you click on it that was created in powerpoint so i'm going to switch over to the powerpoint file now and you can see I have multiple slides in here. I rearrange it. So this is a little unusual. Maybe you may be used to seeing this as more of the sort of the landscape version of the slides. Instead, I made a bunch of pages and the size here doesn't matter so much because I don't tend to print these, although I did make it eight and a half by 11. By doing so, I had some notion of how big this picture was. And actually, if you print this, it would be quite large, but I knew I was gonna take like a screenshot of this or just copy this and paste it into a Word document and then make a PDF, which I just showed you. So I made it a little bit bigger in terms of the font stuff so that when I shrunk it down, it kept some of its resolution. Um, but then when shrunk down, the font sizes and everything matched. <clears throat> so that's a little bit of a, a, a trial and error process perhaps or something you may need to discover on your own is um, what's the best way to kind of set these things up depending on how you ultimately use it. <clears throat> One thing you could do is just draw it sort of the actual size quote unquote um, and keep your font say at 12 point or something of that sort so that you know when you paste it into another document it's of a consistent size. That's kind of totally up to you to, fo to figure those things out. I'm just going to show you the process of how it's done. There's a little bit of work to be done to get things the right size and so forth. And probably I went back and forth a few times to get that the way I wanted. But if I scroll down here, you can see I then took that, <clears throat> that original image, or excuse me, schematic. And by schematic, let me show you here. I can click on this and it comes up as, an, as a large object, but that's been grouped and I'll show you that in a minute. These are all individual things. right? So once this is created, I can copy and paste or really the, the appropriate term for this would be to duplicate that entire schematic, all those elements. And then just in this next slide, delete the ones I don't want or re rearrange them the way I want to show just the, the different states. So there's a state one, there's the state two where the mass has popped up. There's a state three where it's just hit or just before hitting, just after, I don't know if you noticed it moved a little bit in between there. And then up to the end. So it's kind of neat here is if you go, if you scroll through these slides, um, you can actually see the sort of dynamic concept, something you can't get from the static pictures, unfortunately. But anyway, that's what I want to show you is how you could create the basic schematic to start with the overall schematic here, how you can create that in PowerPoint and then use that for whatever you like. Okay, so to do that, I'll just make a brand new one here, a new blank presentation. Let me get rid of these things because I'm not going to be making any titles. I just want a blank slide. And this is why PowerPoint is good for this because this is just a blank slate that it doesn't see anything on. There's no references on there. There's nothing like that to kind of um, decide or determine or limit where I can click on things. 
what I'm about to show you, you can do in Microsoft Word, you can do in Microsoft Excel as well, because it has the same shapes and so forth that you can insert. All the same tools are available. But in Word, it's much pickier about where things are going on the page. In Excel, it's pickier in terms of things going in the cells. So it's harder to do this than it is in PowerPoint, but it can be done. In Word, you can use a drawing canvas to put things in and it behaves the same way, but I prefer to keep things kind of separate. So I'm gonna draw this. Um, I think I'll just do it as it is. I won't bother with trying to resize the page. You could do all that if you want to. It's not totally necessary. I'm just gonna capture the concept. Um, so I'm gonna draw that, again, that schematic that I showed you of the rod with all the masses on the spring. <clears throat> it won't look exactly the same as that probably, but I'm just gonna capture the gist of it. And I may only do some of the elements so I don't take too long, because after a while you'll see it's all pretty similar idea. <clears throat> so basic, I, basic thing, <clears throat> excuse me, there's a shortcut, I'm now on the home tab in the, in the ribbon, there's a shortcut of these elements and things that, I don't know if these are the past ones I used, um, but it has basic shapes like arrows and lines and text box and so forth. You could do probably everything I need to do from there, but really, usually I go to insert, and what's a little bit... Uh, counterintuitive I first let me show you this draw um, menu item it's not what you think it's uh, actually used to highlight things you can draw with it you can do uh, use that if you have a pen this ink to math you can write equations and so forth it's not really what I want and I don't want to draw with touch I'm not drawing this <clears throat> by hand I'm not that good not remotely so I'll go to insert <clears throat> shapes and I guess I'll start with the bottom uh, I make the rod first, the rod itself. So it had at the bottom, so what I clicked on here, there's a rectangle and a rounded rectangle. I wanted a, a rounded rectangle to start with here. So I'll click on that, draw out a basic shape. Let me zoom in a little bit here. So that was kind of the, the shape of the bottom of this. And if I can click off of it, it Excel likes to default, I think, most of the time to things that are blue. <clears throat> Not sure why. You can move this around. You can click on what are called the handles here, make this bigger, smaller. This yellow one is the curvature of the corners. You can change that wherever you want it. Once you've got a shape down there, there's always this, when you click on a shape, there's a shape format item in the, in the ribbon. <clears throat> so here you can do things like, there are the styles you can apply. And what's kind of interesting here, it's not intuitively obvious, when you put any kind of a shape like this, you can type words that are filled into that shape. So it functions in some ways like a text box. It kind of is. I don't want to put any text here, but you could. Um, I very often, I like a shape outline. I, I like to work with just grayscale things. Uh, black for lines um, and, and light color gray. I like to keep it grayscale. Not that you have to. You could use colors. I think it looks a little, uh, a little more professional grayscale. Maybe it's just because of my... My, you know, my past use of these things. Um, <clears throat> I would encourage you not to go too crazy with color. I also like it because I, I don't want the colors to sort of distract from things, unless you want to, unless there's something you really want to em emphasize with the color, then it could be used to great effect. But I'm trying to just capture everything overall just as a, as a, in a fairly muted sort of color scheme. So I like to use things like, maybe I'll make this one a little bit darker like I did in the, um, Again, in the, the picture I showed you before. So whatever size I want this to be. That's the base. <clears throat> I'll zoom back out a little bit. Let's make another one just like that. Or if I really like this, you could copy. It's Control C. I'll click Offset, Control V for paste. That makes a copy. Or there's another shortcut. I just deleted that. If you click on the object you want to, to uh, copy and paste, if you hit Control D for duplicate, it does that immediately. So that's a little bit of a shortcut there. So I want to use this same color scheme and everything to make the upright rod, but I want to change its shape, of course. So you could either just, you could rotate it first. I'm just, I'm not going to mess with that. I'm just going to take this and make it taller. And I want to zoom out a bit so I can make, take a larger advantage of the full height here. When that's selected, I want to point out, if you click on shape format again, at the top right, you can see things, to, and these are buttons that I'm gonna use frequently. There's a line, I'll come to that in a minute. There's rotate, so rotate actually has flipping and rotating, and as you float over those, it'll actually show you a little bit of a preview. preview. Forward, backward, I'll use in a minute here, but what I really wanna show you is if you wanna get precise, you can use these size uh, buttons up here. So maybe I make it, uh, it's too small. They go in 0.1 inch increments. So maybe 0.1 inches wide, 
and I'll make this, uh, if you keep clicking on it, it doesn't really matter, I don't care what, what the height is, but if you did care, you could set that up. So maybe I'll make it, uh, no, 5.7 inches, okay? You might also notice, let me zoom in a bit so perhaps you can see it. As you click this object and move it around, and as more objects get on there too, you'll see that it has these red dashed lines, these guides that show up. So if I, if I move it just the right spot, it shows the end of this right now, if you can see that, based upon the vertical red dashed line, that, that it is now centered in a horizontal sense with that lower block, and the end of it is centered on the horizontal center of the lower block, if that makes sense. So I did want the side to side it to be centered. I don't really care where it is vertically, but I'll just click and release it there. What I want it to look like though, is that that upper, that upright rod now is attached to the bottom block, which means I really want this one in front of it so it looks like it's blocking it. And that's where if you go back, so I'll click on the, the lower block I first made. If I go to shape format, and here I'll say, bring to front from that toolbar. And now you can see what that did. It moved it in front of it, so it looks like now, because it's blocking, the edge is blocking, it looks like it's sort of attached to that. So that's the use of that toolbar. The other way you can do this kind of alignment stuff is if I select, say, the upright bar, and then I'll hold down the Shift key, so I can also select the low one. So these are both selected at the same time now. Then again, the Shape Format, and then the Align button, click and expand that. You've got lots of options in here. Right now, if you've got more than one, the default is align the selected objects to each other. If you only select one, you could actually align it to the slide. I'm not concerned about that right now. But I could also do this align center, and if you look at the little, the little uh, glyph there, it shows you that it would align their centers in the horizontal direction. I already did that, so nothing really happened. Well, maybe I'll, let, me, uh, let me undo that, and then I'll select the two and show you what happens there. So it ends up doing the same thing. It is a little handy sometimes though if you if you controllably move one at a time and watch the guys because then you can decide which one moves. Sometimes if you don't, in fact it's a little annoying, it, it may move both of them or one that you didn't want to move. So that can be a little bit of a problem. <clears throat> I'm also going to do something else here. I'm going to select the two of these. So again, holding down the shift or actually you can even hold the control key and that will enable you to, to click individually. If you, and if you keep clicking, you'll either select or deselect depending upon what's already done. I'm gonna come back to the toolbar, the shape format and say group and then group. So that makes it look like it's one object now. So there's a lot of benefit to that. So from that now, if I click on any of these and move it around, the whole thing moves. I wanna keep that together. And actually, now I'll also show you when you resize, so if now this, this as a grouped object, if I click the handle, say in the bottom, and resize it, it does everything at, together, although it does some weird things in terms of the individual shapes, which I don't really want. Um, but at least it's doing them together. Okay, so let me undo that. So there we are, there's the base. To create the masses, I'll start with, again, insert shapes. I'll get a regular, just a rectangle. Draw out the shape that I want, something like this. And you can start typing right away here if that's selected. I'm just gonna type M. <clears throat> that was the label for the mass. So there you can see it is behaving in that sense as a text box, but it is a box. If I go back to the Home tab here, you can change your font colors if you want. I don't, let me actually make sure the, the letter there is selected. I like black, like I said. Uh, I'm not going to, actually, maybe I'll do it to make it italicized because that's my symbol, so I prefer that. Um, you could also do, here is a vertical alignment. Oh, that's a line spacing. Well, at least we can do the horizontal alignment. I do want that to be centered. Maybe under shape format there is. You can do things such as the text direction. I'm not going to change it, but you can. Here's the aligned text. I want it in the middle. I don't want the bottom or the top, although in this case, I don't think you'll see any difference because it's of a shape that it just, uh, for all intents and purposes, it doesn't move. It, it's not big enough to show that difference, but if it were bigger, it would. So I'll do that. Then I'll come back to shape format again, and I like my shape outline to be black. I want to use maybe a light gray in here for this mass, and there you go. Now, same thing, if I drag this now, since I created this one after I did the other ones, if I move it over, it is already on top of everything else. 
So that's how this works. The most recent things you make will appear, if you, if you place them as such, will appear to be in front of other things. And that's what I want. So there's my mass. Now, if you remember too, the, the picture, I had another one called 2M, uh, which is a little, I drew it a little bit bigger because it was supposed to be twice the mass. That was the concept of that. That's why it was 2M. So I'm going to hit Control D and duplicate that. And notice I'm using my guides to know. So this is interesting here. This shows that it's lined up edge to edge with the other one. But what if I had actually made this one bigger to begin with? Because I do want it bigger. And actually, another thing, what if you wanted this square? Absolutely perfectly square. You could go to, while it's selected, go to your size and you can actually click in the numbers, 0.8 by 0.8. Or the other thing you can do, I think this will work. If I hold down the shift button, no, shift maintains whatever it's at. So if I hold down the shift button and drag, it will keep that aspect ratio no matter how big I make it. So really, if I want this to be square, I'm going to have to make it uh, so with the, or you do it when you draw it out. Okay, so let's say I want it square. I want it to be 2M. And so now if I bring this over here, you can see the different guides let me line up to edges of different things if you want. I really want it centered, so if I place it right here, hopefully you can see if you look closely, it's got the red dash line right in the center, so I'll put it there, and you can even tell when the handles are centered sometimes. By the way, I'll use this opportunity to point out, see when you select an object, when it has, maybe I'll move it off the side so it's a little bit clearer, it has this little circle icon, the arrow here, circular arrow. If you click on that and hold with your mouse, it lets you rotate things. I use this sometimes, I don't use it too much because I find sometimes it, I, I actually release it and it's not quite perfectly 90 degrees, let's say. Uh, if you want to rotate a specific amount, you could go to the, again, the shape format toolbar. There's a rotate. And if you say more rotation options, you could actually dial in an actual specific angle like 32 degrees if you wanted to. I don't want to do that, I'm going to undo, but you can. Oh, so by the way, I should have shown you here Shape format, let me go back. I don't want to do the rotation, but I'll show you. This uh, little sub-menu on the right, this little sub-window, um, should look fairly familiar. It's got the paint bucket, this uh, pentagon, I guess it is, um, and the size and properties pop up. So it gives you more detail than what just the toolbars would do. Height, width, rotation, scale, height, scale, width. So this you could actually dial in on it to be 50% and so forth, if you don't feel like doing the math. Lock aspect ratio means if you check that, if you change one of these heights, scale height to 50%, it will automatic, automatically make the width 50% too. So you can do position, you can do things about the text box here. So things I had shown you about the alignment, horizontal and middle, things like that with auto fit too. So there's a lot of things you can do there that are more detailed. Um, here's where you can affect the color, do different kinds of uh, <clears throat> shading and so forth. I just wanted to show you that this is sort of a master window when you select this, which does a lot of what uh, some of the buttons in the toolbar will do, but then even more than that. So sometimes this is a handy thing to come to. Okay, so let me put that back centered. When it's there too, you can also, I can use the arrow keys now. I'm pressing the down arrow key on my keyboard to move things to, it's called nudge. Nudge these things a little bit if you want to have a slight adjustment on uh, positioning. Okay. The picture also had a little bit of a, a triangular tab which was holding that in place. So I'll go back to shapes again. I'll get the triangle. I'll draw out here a basic shape. Here's another little pop-up that appears. The arrows, if you click that, it lets you move this around. Again, you can see all the red guides popping up in terms of spacing and alignment. I actually want this to be rotated 90. So here I will grab this and just move it. Okay. Uh, again, I like my outline to be black. I want my shape fill to be pretty dark in this case here. And then I can move this in and it was kind of placed right there to kind of show. And if you need to, you can zoom in on this, right? I'm holding down the control key and using my mouse wheel to zoom in. Other ways you can do the zoom if you like is down here at the very bottom right, there's a little toolbar that has zoom on it that you can get to. Okay, so I just want this to show that it's sort of a tab there supporting that 2M so it can't slide down until the lower mass hits it. That's the idea of that. <clears throat> so put that in there. Uh, I think I'll leave it there for now. The original picture, so my, my proportions are a bit off. I had the rod long enough that I could show this lower mass touching this, the second mass, the 2M, and they were higher up in sort of a ghosted position. 
Um, I'll leave that off here now because I didn't really leave enough room for that. That's probably why I made this more of a portrait style as I figured out I was running out of room here on the document. Uh, but you can change that easily enough. I will show you just here again, if I wanted to make those, I could take my uh, 2M and duplicate that. I'll move it off the side here just for simplicity. And what I did is under shape format, I had made the fill even lighter. So maybe the lightest one that's here. And I made this shape outline. <clears throat> I had showed you changing the color. There's all kinds of other colors you can select, standard colors. You can turn off the outline if you don't want it. Uh, eyedropper lets you pick a color from something else, which is kind of handy if you want to match it to something else. You can change the weight of this. I don't want the sketch would make it look kind of wobbly, like you really did sketch it by hand, which is kind of neat sometimes. That's not what I want here, but I do find that's kind of neat sometimes. Uh, I'm going to go down to uh, dashes and select this one. So the idea is trying to show this ghosted outline that this was something that was you know in in the future, let's say, or that's not a right way of saying that, but it was a a position. That's really what it meant. It was the later position of the masses, but. I could also duplicate the smaller one again, line it up here, get it nice and close. And then I'll kind of come in with the, um, with my arrow keys. So I get it lined up and then I could do, I'll show you this, uh, actually, let's see, is there a format painter on this? I guess there isn't, there might be on home though. Let me try this. So if I select that object, I hit this format painter and then click on this object it will match all of that stuff. So that's not an obvious one that it can do that. You might have used the format painter on other things such as text and so forth, but it works on the objects just as well. Here's one where I probably do if I select the two of these, so I can drag out with a cursor, I can drag out a box and select them both at once. And this is a thing that you can't do if you do the drawing say in Excel or in Word without a drawing canvas, because when you click off of an object, in words say it would put the cursor on a, on a line and expect you to start typing you can't just select out like this so that's why powerpoint is good for this shape format group these are together now so they'll move together as long as i don't do anything to set that so to speak now i could place these together uh centered on the um this rod eh, i could do this i can actually extend this up here let me just select only that one inside and I'll go to shape format and make that longer but then it messed up everything down here but I can move that up inside the grouped object so now I do have the space just fits it's good enough uh, let me click on just this grouped object move it up a bit and then I'll select these and with the arrow keys move it down a bit so I could do something like that, somewhat preserve the original picture. Okay, again, a lot of times you're drawing these things, you're gonna have to go back and forth a few times and change some things around it. it uh, you could sketch it out by hand, say on something else first, if you wanna make sure you got things correct, but I, that's good enough. I already had a picture, so I'm mostly there. <clears throat> so what's left to do is to create some labels, some dimension marks, and more importantly, there was a spring at the bottom. So let me zoom in down here. How will we make this spring? And this is a pretty interesting uh, use of this that I think shows the, the, the power of it. So what is the spring if we go back to, maybe I'll go back to um, the original and I'll show you what it looks like, where we're going. Whoop, too far. So it's just a bunch of lines, really. Right, but they're in this kind of uh, zigzag pattern here, so to speak. Got a couple of ends on it that show where they kind of squared off. And also notice how there's this use of some going in front and some going coming behind that, that shaft that kind of shows the concept of being wrapped around. So here's how we can do that uh, to make a spring. So I'll come back to my new one here. I'm gonna start by going to insert shapes. I'm gonna grab just the line and I'm gonna draw out at some angle here, it doesn't have to be too extreme. So it's a fairly small uh, line. I'm gonna go to, notice there's no fill for a line, shape outline, make it black like I like. I'm gonna make the weight quite heavy. So let's say, I'll do three point, okay? And here's something else. Let me go to shape outline and I want to do, I need to get into the Let's see, is there an easy way? I guess it really 
I'm just going to have to go down and say something like uh, any one of these I can pick dashes, weight arrows, whatever, and say more lines. What it does is trying to get to this shape, this format shape sub window because I want to do something here. I've clicked on the, it was already here, but if not, you could click on the paint bucket. Here's where you can get into all of the really um, fine details of what this looks like. And what I want to do, I'm going to zoom in even further on this line here. Notice it has these squared ends. I want that to be round so it looks more like a, like a round wire that was bent up. So if you go down to cap type, it has flat and I'm going to say round. So now you can look at that and see it's rounded on the ends which is kind of uh, much nicer looking. So I'm going to come back, duplicate that, okay, and then I'm going to go up to the shape format menu where it says rotate and I'm going to flip vertical. In this case vertical because what I'm drawing is I'm drawing this spring as if it's got an axis that's horizontal and I'll rotate it. You could do it either way you want. I'm just used to doing it this way. Uh, so I flipped it vertically and then if I draw, bring this over, you'll see as I move it over it's well here it looks like an X but it's got these guides, these red and dash guides. If I bring it over close enough it will actually sort of snap to the end of the other one which is what I want. Actually, I think I might want this a little bit more compressed, but I'll show you in a minute how you can fix it. So now I've got what looks like one coil. If I select the two of those and hit duplicate, control D, it will do duplicate both. I'll grab that before I unclick. So this is not grouped, so you have to be careful here. If I click on one and move it, it'll, it'll separate them. I don't want that. But if they're both selected here, let me drag out and select them both. If you click and move this, it will bring them, it will move them together. I'll bring it up until then I can connect those ends together. And now it's starting to look like a spring. And so this is what's really nice about this. It understands that sort of relationship now. If I hit Control D again, no, oh, it didn't do it. It will this time though, I think. Let me move this up. And Control D, now it will. I think because before I had, I had kind of fiddled around with it. But if you, if you duplicate something and move it <clears throat> right away, don't do anything else, you hit Duplicate again, it will understand the relative position. It'll just kind of spread these out. Okay, I'll duplicate again maybe. However many you want to put in here. Last thing I'll do is I will select one of these. I'll hit duplicate. And now I'm going to go under shape format up to the size. Or you could actually come even down into here somewhere. Here. Either way you want to do it. Um, I'm going to put the width at zero, which makes it vertical. And the height, I'm going to take it's 0.18. See, it won't let me do a scale here on a line, but I can make it, let's make it 0.1, so it's shorter. I just want a little bit of like a clipped end on the spring, and then I'll bring it in here and stick it there. So it connects, and I kind of like them to go in opposite directions. So let me go on the other side, I'll delete just that last coil. I'm gonna duplicate the end and connect it up, and there you go, there's my spring. I can select this. I'm gonna group this right away and then you can rotate it. See, I have a, I'm going to undo that. I'm going to rotate um, by, the, by the strict menu so I know I get it right. So there's my spring. It is grouped. So it looks like one object. And what's neat about this, then, if I take this and click, let's say, the, the center handle, you can make it look like it's compressing and stretching just like a spring would do. It's kind of cool. If you ungroup this, I'll show you what happens. If you just leave it ungrouped and try to do that, well, see, it doesn't, right? You can't do that. You can't move it or shrink it, say, as a whole. So you really want this group for right now, anyways. Let me move it over. And now I can see I really want this a little bit wider. So again, since it's grouped, I can just drag this out. I want it to stick out a little bit past the end of the, uh, of the, the sides of this shaft so it looks like... Um, you know, it's it, well. You can see the concept of it, sort of spring-like. This doesn't. Sh it doesn't. Uh, it should with the guides. If I get the, it doesn't really tend to show the. Oh, there it is. It's hard to see, but right there, the uh, red dashed vertical line is showing that that's centered on the shaft. And maybe I want to bring this down so that I get the concept of it just beneath the mass, so I get my height right. There's my. Now it's at the bottom. I have to fix it. Let me do that down here too there so it's like it's placed in there and maybe I will yeah I'll just leave it at that I suppose I really should bring this to the front 
the lower pedestal, the lower base, if I want to make sure that it looks like that, that's again kind of covering it, but that's fine. What this doesn't show is that concept of alternating in front and behind the spring. So the way, the really only way to do that is I do have to ungroup this because I want part of these to be in front of everything else and part of these to be behind. So I do have to go back. I'm going to say ungroup. Now these are all separate and let's say I'll make, um, if this one is in front here of the lower part of the spring, then this one I want to be in back. That means I'm going to hold the control key now and hold it down while I click on all of these alternating coils. And then that one. Oops, nope, not that. That. And then I'm going up to the shape format toolbar and I'm going to say send to back. So it put them all behind the shaft and now it looks like it's coiling around that. So that's exactly the, the effect that I wanted. Um, I don't believe you can now group these back together because if you do, say I, I just selected these and I said group, you can't because it as a group it has to either all be in back or all be in front. So you can't do that. But there's our spring. Pretty cool. Let's make our coordinate system. So that is insert shapes. Now I'll get the, the line with an arrow on it and I'll just drag out um, whatever length you want here. I think the default arrows are terrible. Again, I'll make it black under shape outline, shape format, shape outline. Then under the same uh, sub menu here, I'm going to go down and say under arrows, I like the one that's just the simple arrowhead. Um, I think this needs to be a little bit heavier, maybe uh, one point or three, maybe three quarter point. You can use your judgment on that, what you think looks best. So there's my X axis. Control D, whoops, Control D to duplicate. I'll go to shape format. I'm going to rotate that left 90 degrees. So that gives me the up part. Now, how to line these up? Because we want these to kind of be end to end, right? So here's what's kind of nice about this. I'll use the arrow, or the cursor, excuse me, and select the two arrows. Let me close this sub window here. Select the two arrows and then under shape format, go back to the align toolbar. I'm gonna align them on the left, which will bring it over. And then I'm gonna align them on the bottom, which brings it down. And now they are end to end. Pretty neat. Now I'm going to say insert and under shapes, a text box. Now, you, again, you could use these other shapes to do this. I, this seems to me most appropriate to use a text box because I'm gonna put text in it. So you see you get what looks like a regular cursor to type things. I'll put that near there where I want to label the X axis. Kind of move that up so it's sort of in line. I usually use the arrow keys to fiddle with that a little bit. Um, duplicate, move it up and I'll make that say Y. And there's my coordinate system. I'll select all four of these things now with the cursor and I will say shape format and group. Those I definitely want to be as one item so I can move it around wherever. I usually just end up placing this wherever it seems to be somewhat clear but not in the way of things because I want it to be obvious. In this particular case, I'm, there's nothing special about the origin or where it's located. Sometimes there is a, a something special about where the origin is located. I just want the basic directions here. So I'll just kind of place that dangling in space somewhere. Oh, actually, let me take that back. I do want the Y axis to start at what I'm calling a zero. It's defined by the unstretched length of the spring. So there was an area, area in here um, where we define this delta as being that the defining the compressed distance of the spring. So this makes a good time here. It's a good uh, place to talk about putting dimensions on this. I like to show dimensions with the, the lines that kind of delineate things being dashed. I'll show you in a minute what I mean by that. And then smaller head arrows. I usually like finer sort of arrows for the dimensions the, the, where the labels are so they don't sort of overwhelm everything. So here's what I mean by that. I'm going to insert shape, just a plain line. I'm going to drag it out. By the way, when you're doing lines here, you notice when I float over, say, any of these objects, it puts these gray dots. These are handles that let you connect things where they'll keep things tied to each other. So there'll be more sort of dynamic connections that if I move an object, those lines move with it. That's not what I want here. So I'm not going to, I'm going to not click on that. Although I want it to sort of line up with that. What I'm going to do instead is uh, I'm just going to draw out a horizontal line. That's not exactly where I want it. 
I want it though to, to be in the same orientation to line up with my x-axis from my uh, coordinate axes. Problem is now if you click on that since I grouped it the bottom is somewhere else. That's okay. Instead I'll click on the line that I'm trying to maneuver. I'm going to use my arrow keys to get it so it visually lines up. So it's, it's set there in terms of the vertical orientation. Now I'm going to actually use it to move it, my arrow keys to move it to the right and move it over. Okay, so I kind of want this, as you see here, I want this to be black again. I want it to be dashes. I don't want it quite this long. Um, I can change again back to shape format size. I can shorten this. Okay, so somewhere about there to start with. So that's defining a line here. Um, in space and that, that is lined up with the x-axis to be y equals zero in, in other words select that line duplicate it and now I want it to be lining up to the top of the lower mass because that was defining that position to start with which turns out to be how much the spring is compressed according to this I don't want the line that long I'm going to draw it back Unfortunately, it doesn't give me these little indicators that it lines up with the oops with the other one above it because I do want them the same length. I'll take care of that in a minute once I get these all done. So I'm going to have a similar one. I'm going to duplicate, and that's going to go. If you remember our original picture at the bottom of the 2m mass. Again, if you don't know, you could place it to and so it's lined up, and then I'm going to move the arrows to kind of move it over. I don't want it to touch. I want it to be close to the edge, but a little over. Again, this would actually have to be a little bit shorter to line up to all these other ones down here. And then I had one that was exactly the same as that duplicate that went up uh, to here. So I've got now all of the main sort of dimension extents, if I could call them that, from the drawing. These are things you would know probably after you've drawn it. I'm just showing you how once it's set you could do that. So I'm going to select, I'm holding down the control key, I'm going to select all of these and then I'm going to say align. Now I want to align them on the right. So they all are kind of extending the same distance. Maybe move them back a little bit once I do that. Okay, so they're showing, marking these locations that I want to show dimensions for. Now I just need to put in the arrows and the actual symbols for the dimensions. So the first one I had, I'll do down at the bottom here. The, the first, the smallest dimension here is what we call delta. So I'll go insert shapes. Um, if you go down, there's a, actually a more extensive one of lines. I'll show you. Here's the double headed arrow. You don't have to do that. You could check at the, just a plain line, the line with the single arrow or the double arrow. Any one of those you could go in and modify it to look like the other. But I mean, we could save a little bit of time here. So again, I'm not going to draw on that. I'm just going to click here and do something that looks like that. And then I'll reposition it with the arrow keys to be in the center of the two dashed lines. Again, I hate that format, so I'll go black. Um, arrows, I'm going to do the double simple arrowheads. And I actually like here, again, if I do the weight, you'll notice if you make it a little smaller, like uh, eh, I could do a quarter point. Actually, it didn't change the arrowhead size like I thought. But you could go down to shapes, arrows, more arrows. And when it pops up at the very bottom, you could change the begin arrow size. So maybe I'll make it a little more like that. And the end arrow size I'll make to match that, which is more like that. So it's not quite as big. I want it a little bit smaller. That's just a preference there. This was supposed to be a dimension delta. How do we get to delta? Remember, that's a symbol. I don't have a shortcut up here. I guess I do, actually. But it doesn't appear. I can't just click on it. Well, that's because it's got to be placed inside something. So let me get again here, by the way. I have grouped my um, coordinate stuff. But if you if you click here, I'll show you. If you just click in there, the whole thing is selected. If you click again on an object in that group, you can select just that object and modify it. I'm going to select that. I'm going to hit Copy, Control-C. I'll click off of it and Control-V. I can paste that as an object that's not inside the group. All I was doing is I was saving some steps of not having to create and, and, and format a new text box. 
I just wanted a text box here. So now if you click inside the text box, I get my symbol um, shortcut, or again, you could go to insert, and you can see on that toolbar we'll have a, a shortcut to the, or a button for the symbol window that pops up. I expanded this so it looks very busy, um, but in there you can find delta. I'll say insert and then close. So I now have delta and then I'll get rid of the X because I don't want the X, I just want the delta. Um, I don't usually, that sometimes doesn't look good italicized, so I'll just leave it there. And then position it where you want with respect to the, to the arrow. So that's defining that dimension as delta. So that's good. I want to repeat a similar process. So let me click on, I'll select, I just want the arrow. I'll hit duplicate. I want that lined up to it. So I'll, I'll place it so that I know it is lined up in the horizontal direction. Again, use the arrows to kind of place it where I want more or less. And then we'll see which way this lets me go. If I go back to shape format, yeah, see, that's usually what happens is um, the, yeah, I'll just move it where I want it and extend it. And then I'll worry about aligning things. That's too long. So somewhere around in here. Again, that is aligned. If I move it down, I can see it's aligned. I'll move it back with the arrow keys so it's kind of centered in there. So there's my next one. I might as well finish that concept with the arrows before I go on. So I will duplicate one more time. Now it's lined up. And that little handle usually is touching the line. That's how I know the length is right. I'm just gonna have to draw this out. Maybe a little bit more. That's too far. I think that's good. So there's that one. Now the difference in this drawing, see, this dimension that I labeled delta was a little, it was too small. I couldn't put the label in the middle of the arrow or it would just obliterate it. Sometimes if it's really small, you might even have to put it off to the side with another sort of an arrow pointing to that dimension. But these bigger ones, I can put my label right in the middle, which is more customary. So I can actually copy the text box now that had the delta in it. So I'll select it and say duplicate, control D. Notice something, if I put it right on top of this, which is kind of what I want, I see the arrow through it. Actually, first of all, let me change it. It's supposed to be H, not Delta. That's fine, I'll click in there and change it to H. So that's what I want. I sort of want the label like that, but I don't want to see the arrow behind it. I'd like to leave a little white gap. Remember, this is a text box. So if I select it, so when you first click on it, it shows kind of ready to do something to the text. If you click on the border of that, then you've selected that as the box. If I go to Shape Format, I'm gonna change the shape fill. Right now it has no fill, which is why you can see through it. If I make it white to match the background, then it leaves this gap. Don't put, a, don't put an outline, because if you put a, uh, a, a outline on that, then you've got this, and that I don't think looks right, right. That looks more like a separate block. We don't want the outline. So no outline, but we want a white fill. And then it sort of leaves the gap around the label, but it's clear that that means that that's referring to the arrow, the dimension arrows. So that's what I want. So I'm gonna cop, uh, du uh, duplicate that again, um, bring that up. And uh, if you want that to be centered on the arrow, so we can select that, hit Control or Shift, click on the arrow. You could go to Shape Format, Align, and in this case, you wanna say Align Middle. Gotta be a little careful, because sometimes, like I said, it'll move the arrow to or instead, which I wouldn't want. In this case, it did what I wanted. It moved just the label, so that's good. This new label, I want to be D. I'm going to move that into, and here I can see that that's gonna be centered on the arrow. I can select it, shape, fill, align, middle, and there. Okay. If you really wanna be sure about this, you could select the, the label. You could then select also the arrow. You could say shape format and you could say group. And now you, they will stay together even if you tweak some things in here. I don't usually do that though because I do find as I move things around I have to adjust some of these dimension lines and it messes that up. <clears throat> so that's almost everything. All that's missing are these uh, side labels that I had indicating what things were. So there's one that said that we had a frictionless rod. 
So let's start with that. To do the, the wording that is under insert shapes, that's a text box. And this is frictionless rod. When you do this labeling here, be consistent with your fonts and sizes. So this right now is a 18 point font, which is quite large. If you pasted it real size in your documents and your documents use a 12 point font, that would look pretty goofy, unless you really wanted this picture to stand out giant. Uh, I don't think that looks good, but remember I'm planning on taking this, this whole diagram and shrinking it um, when I paste it into another document. So I'm planning for that. I noticed I forgot I wanna make these italicized. Let me do that. Okay, I won't italicize my labels over here. So anyways, this is fine for now. So what about now, I think when you have labels like this, you should do something to use, say, a curved arrow or something that indicates it's not a dimension line, it's not something specific about the, the um, shape or whatever. It, it, it's meant to be just a, a, a indicator, a connector to your label. So the way you would do that, insert, shapes, there are these, uh, you can see these different squiggly looking things. What I want is one that looks more like a gentle sort of slope, a, a curve. So you, you could use the arc. Um, you can experiment. I don't like that because it's more restricting on how you do your curvature and stuff. This one here that says curve is it's really a, what's called a Bezier curve. It gives you the ability to do some pretty neat things with what are called the, the handles. And I'll show you this. It's better just to show you. I'm going to click. I'm going to click once, which anchors it. If you click again, you get another anchor. And then you can see as I, so I click twice, I haven't clicked again yet, but now I get this ability to kind of warp what this looks like. I'm just gonna click anywhere with it. Double click actually. And that ends it. Let me zoom in on that. I put a bunch more dots in here than I meant. I only meant to click uh, three times here, but I'll show you in a minute what, the, what that changed. So now if you click the handles on this as it is, you'll actually get this to kind of stretch out just the, in the shape it's got. But I want to have a finer control under that. So under the shape format, there is this edit shape. Click on that and say edit points. And if you can see here, it's got all these black squares. These are these handles that you can click on that let you fine tune the shape of this. You can change where they're located. And when you click on a black dot, you get these lines with the, the white squares. These are how you can change curvature. So what I want to do here is I don't want all of these black dots. So I'm going to delete. I'm going to actually come in here. One of the black ones, I'm going to right click and say delete point. And I'm going to actually take the other one, right click and say delete point. If you do this with it when it was more straight looking, it may not look like you're able to do some of these changes I'm about to do, but you can. So I'm left with two of these black dots, just beginning and end. But if you click on them with the left mouse button, you can see now since they're endpoints, you don't get two white squares, you only get one. But as you change these, you can actually shift sort of the curvatures. You can position where they, where they are. Again, you can change the, the look of it. You can change the total. Uh, if you drag them further, you can, you can change what, how big that curve is. So you could do something, oh, let's say like this, which is a sort of a nice smooth uh, looking line. And then you could go to shape outline down to arrows. And well, in this case, I'll put one on the end. So let me zoom out now. I'll show you what this, let me actually make this black too, because again, it came out blue shape outline color black and there we go frictionless rod so once you have one of these you can actually copy that even if you want to change the curvature you've got the basic idea there so i had another one that said uh so i'm going to select both of these hit D control d for duplicate just move it up and now you could just change the text here to say later positions of masses and by the way um, if you just reshape the box, you can force it to change short of, sort of its um, positioning of the text in it. I like them centered. And maybe I'll move that up. So I left the arrow the same. Nothing wrong with that. You can change it if you want to. Then I had another one. So this, select the two, duplicate. Maybe here I want this arrow to not be quite so long. If I don't go back to the edit points and I just take one of the handles, you can shrink it. You can change a little bit of the shape, at least the look of that shape, without really doing anything more advanced than that. This was the 
uh, tab that holds mass 2m in place. I called it tab that holds mass 2m in place. And the 2m was italicized. And then I can resize this, maybe more like that. Center that. So I've got that label. And then I had at the bottom one more. Duplicate. And this was the massless ideal spring. Massless ideal spring K, meaning that's the, the spring constant for that. So there we go. I'm going to zoom out. And that is our whole schematic. So not too bad. It's it's a pretty uh, it's got some pretty interesting features that were made with just very simple tools in PowerPoint, um, but using the arrows to do and the and the edit points to do some curvature effects with our with our labels, um, consistent fonts, consistent sizes, uh, arrows for the dimensions and locations of things. Um, we made extensive use of. Let me click on one of these just so I can show you here the shape format toolbar, which has shape fill shape outline i use this all the time um, the forward backward uh, there's a selection pane i didn't show if you click on that it shows you all the objects that are on here so you can come in and select these things individually i don't tend to have much of a use for this but sometimes i do you can turn things on or off from here okay not sure why you want to do that but there might be a reason for that um, there's also again back to the format shape so it's got a couple of different windows that you can check select between there. Uh, I make extensive use of the align here. I didn't show you the distribute horizontally and vertically, but you can figure out what that does. Um, rotate I use, group I use extensively. I extensively use the size here. Um, so quite a few neat things. Again, there's a little bit of a shortcut window for the, the more used shapes, I guess. Okay, when all is done, I do also tend to select everything and group the whole set just so that if I copy and paste this or move it around on this page, I know that the whole thing's gonna go together. I didn't, don't inadvertently misplace something. But now, you know, if you wanted to take this whole thing to make versions of it, you can duplicate the entire thing. And then you could go in and delete things that you didn't want. I mean, I can ungroup all of this. So now if I didn't want all of these to repeat on my other one, I just want to show parts of this. You can just delete what you don't want, right? Maybe I'll get rid of some of these things. Whatever you wanted to show, right, in the different uh, uh, diagrams. Then maybe you're going to move this one up, right, and you're going to stretch the spring at the bottom. Whatever you want to do. I won't go through that. That depends upon your particular application. And there you go. That's how you can use PowerPoint to create some pretty um, significant uh, uh, schematics. And by the way, that uh, first example I showed you with the box sliding on that hill, that was just a bunch of these curved lines connected together, changing their um, weights and so forth. So you can do some pretty significant things here.